Hey, you guys, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name's Danny Carroll. I'm with Alabama Extension, and we are a proud sponsor of this webinar series, along with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Clemson Cooperative Extension, University of Georgia Extension, as well as the E-Extension Communities of Practice, AntPest, and Urban IPM. Now, before I introduce the speaker, if there are any Tennessee pesticide applicators that are here for points, if you will look in the chat box, I am giving you a link to a Google document that today I'm, I'm pretty excited about this webinar. I love vegetables. I like to eat. And just like everybody else, a lot of times insects get to them first. So we have Zach Snipes, a horticulture extension agent from Clinton Cooperative Extension. And he's here to give us some practical information on how to save our veggie harvest. So Zach, thank you so much for being here today. Okay. Um, so thank you guys for having me. Um, as mentioned by Danny, my name is Zach Snipes. I'm a uh, horticulture agent for Clemson Cooperative Extension Service. Um, I work in the low country of South Carolina. So uh, Charleston, Beaufort, the Southern coast. Um, here we have a lot of commercial vegetables, a lot of big acreage. We also have a lot of small farms that I work with too. So I'm really blessed to, to work with this group of folks. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk about protecting your veggie har harvest from hungry insects. Cause the worst thing that can happen if you grow a garden is you grow all season and you're waiting for that first tomato and then you get this um, in your tomato. So that's the worst thing that can happen. So we're gonna to try to find out ways, tips and tricks to avoid that. All right, so the presentation today, we're gonna to start with um, having a good foundation for your plants. Um, then we're gonna dive into integrated pest management, and then we're gonna talk about insect management examples. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through um, tomatoes, all the insects that get on tomatoes and how to deal with them. I'm also gonna talk about squash, all the insects that get on squash and how to deal with them, and also brassica. So anything um, in the collard, kale, broccoli, collard, cauliflower family. We're going to talk about all the insects and, and how to deal with those guys. All right, so the first thing you need to do uh, to protect your vegetables from insects is start with a good foundation. It's just like building a house. Uh, the foundation is the first thing that's, that's laid. Um, a lot of time and care is spent in that foundation, and the same thing should be true with your vegetables. Um, preparation is key. Uh, whether you're prepping the ground, you're preparing for the season, you have to educate yourself. Um, and that means, you know, really studying up on, on what you're growing, how you're going to grow it, what insects are going to be on there, when you're going to plant it, um, really having a roadmap to, to ensure success. Um, the second thing we want to talk about is soils and how to make your soils the best that they can be. We're going to talk a little bit about crop selection and timing, crop maintenance, scouting experience, and just basic common sense. But again, it all goes back to plants need a healthy foundation. If you have a a healthy plant to begin with, it's going to be a lot harder for uh, that plant to succumb to the, the damage that, that the insects are going to inflict on it. All right, so the first thing <clears throat> that I tell folks that want a garden that, that call here and they say, um, you know, these insects are, are eating my tomatoes or eating my squash, the first thing I, I ask them is, well, did you plant it on paper? Um, did, you, did you find a good site? Did you find a site that has sunlight? Uh, vegetables need at least six hours of sunlight. Um, and those are going to be your leafy vegetables, so your lettuces and your collards, onions. Um, your fruiting vegetables, they typically like more sunlight. You know, 8 to 12 hours of sunlight would be even better. So do you have that in the place you're uh, planting? Um, the second thing is access to water. Um, irrigation is crucial, and I'll go through that a little later, but irrigation is crucial to grow in a good, strong, healthy plant. Um, I see that we have a lot of folks from Indiana and Iowa and Alabama and all over um, I'm not sure what your soils are like, but down here in Charleston, we have really, really sandy soils. So drainage really isn't an issue. Um, water runs through our soils really, really fast. But if you've got more of a clay or a silty type soil, um, you may need to amend your soil or improve your soil so you don't have standing water. Um, and then the, the last thing as far as site selection goes is what's around you when you're growing. I, I work with a lot of farmers, and I've seen multiple fields. Um, they'll have long, skinny fields and the long skinny field will be surrounded by trees on all three sides. 
Well, this creates shade for a quarter of the day or maybe even a third of the day. There's shade on the plants. And the plants, no matter how much fertilizer you give them, no matter how many pesticides you spray on them, they're never really going to look right because they, they didn't get optimal sunlight. So site selection is crucial. Um, the second thing is once you, you find your site, it's crop planting. Um, I like to tell folks to work in crop rotations, to work in cover crops, to work in, work in pollinator plots. And the reason you do this, this is a, <clears throat> we have a school gardening uh, program here in South Carolina. Um, and this is a, a layout of our beds. And so each season, um, the, the schools, they, they rotate within the beds, what they're planting, and then they rotate seasonally and they also rotate by the beds. And so this kind of gives a roadmap of what you're gonna grow, how you're gonna grow it. And then um, these little diagrams, if you can see here, um, they kind of show the spacing between plants. Um, and you'll also see if we're growing it from sets, if we're growing it from transplants, if we're growing it from seed, what this does is, is a lot of plants do better as a transplant. A lot of plants do better if you direct seed them. And so that goes back to the education component of it is, is knowing what you're going to grow and really using that to, um, to make the right plant, the right selection and grow it the right way to give it the best start it can have. Um, this is a little um, plot that I worked with a, a farmer. Um, before I got there, he had two basic fields, two big fields, one here and one here. Um, and he was really mismanaging the field because it was such a large field. He couldn't water it properly. He couldn't take care of things because it was a lot to take care of. And so what we ended up doing was we broke the field up into eight quadrants. And so... Um, the first year, it was spring of 2015, we planted tomatoes in quadrant one, tomatoes and peppers actually. And then in quadrant five, we planted a soil building uh, cover crop. So we planted cowpeas and uh, we followed that with millet later in the season. So we're, we're building soil with our cover crops here. We're growing our production vegetables here. Right here in, in block six, we grew beans. And so again, we're building the soil, but we're also growing something that we can sell. And then in block seven, we had a pollinator plot. So we had a lot of wildflower mixes. We had buckwheat growing. Um, and then we followed that by in block eight, we had more tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. Then we had our cover crops in block four. We had our more beans in block three. And then in block two, we had more pollinators. And so what this did was where we had our production areas and we're really, really focusing on management in those production areas. But we also, we also um, have cover crops, so we're building soil. And then with our pollinator plants, we're attracting pollinators or we're also attracting beneficials, which I'll talk about later. But basically, if you have that habitat built into your crop rotation, you're going to have those pests there all year round and they're going to do pest control for you year round rather than having them for two months and then there's nothing there for them to eat for the rest of the year. Um, what we also noticed, and this is, um, you know, just, just having prior knowledge and the, the history of the field, is this area of the field is closer to the woods, so we get a little more shade. Um, but also, when we grow tomatoes in these blocks right here, the spider mite pressure is a lot higher because the spider mites tend to come from this area for whatever reason. And so the grower knew that. And so what we did was we, we know that spider mites are going to come from this area. And so we start scouting for spider mites earlier and we expect to have them longer and for them to be more persistent than if they're on the backside um, of the, the, the plot plants. And so that's just kind of knowing um, your crop, kind of knowing the pests and then knowing your field and how they all work together. Um, so I've talked a little bit about education, but you really need to educate yourself before you plant. Um, in the winter of the year is a good time because it's cold and you're itching to get outside, but really read up on your crops. Read up on your variety selection. Um, are we growing heirlooms? Are we growing open pollinated plants? Are we growing F1 hybrids? What type of plant are you growing? What's the growth habit of that plant? Does it like a lot of fertilizer? Does it not like a lot of fertilizer? Is it a, deter a determinant tomato? Is it it an indeterminate tomato. So knowing these things and how to manage them can really um, kind of set you apart um, early in the season. Another thing that I think uh, folks overlook is, is days to maturity. 
So um, broccoli, for example, we have some varieties of broccoli that, that can come in in 55 or 60 days. But we also have varieties of broccoli that are 85 to 90 day varieties. Well, if I'm a home gardener if, or if I'm a grower and I can get a, a good quality crop out of a 55 day broccoli, why would I not plant that 55 day crop broccoli? Because that's 55, uh, that's what, 40 days or 30 days of insect management that I don't have to do if I grew the wrong variety, the longer season variety. And so just knowing your variety and how they grow and the, the time it takes them to mature is really important. Knowing the potential pests, so knowing what pests are going to feed on those crops, it's no surprise ever that a pest is going to get on your crops. They're going to get on them, but you should know ahead of time which ones are going to be there. Um, past that, knowing the proper control of those pests before they get there and being prepared um, is a big deal. I work with a lot of farmers and um, I'll scout their, fi their fields and they always call me on Friday afternoon. And so I'll go out there and look at their fields on Friday afternoon and I'll find an insect and I'll say, you know, you've done everything you can. We really need to treat this. Well, then I recommend a, a product to them and they say, well, I got to call my chemical guy. So the chemical guy, he's already taken off on Friday. And so by Monday, they call the chemical guy and then he gets it shipped to him by Wednesday. And so he's had four days there that he didn't treat an insect problem because he wasn't prepared and had that product on hand. They didn't do their homework ahead of time. And so that four days cost them four days of that insect feeding on the plant. If it's a caterpillar, it could, it could be in the inside of the tomatoes now. If it's a sap sucking insect, it could uh, have sucked all the juices out of the plant. And so being prepared, having what you need on hand before the insect gets there is a, is a really smart practice. And then lastly, kind of talk, like I talked about with the spider mites coming out of that section of woods, know your previous season's successes and failures. Know where the insects are going to come from. Whether you make mental notes, whether you physically write it down on a piece of paper, um, knowing when things are going to come and when you've had issues before, if you look back over your notes, can help you prepare for the next season. Um, here in Charleston, we have a lot of insect and disease pressures that come up from Florida. And so you can almost plan your, your schedule on when the, you know, the time of year when those insects and diseases are going to get here. And um, just being prepared really, really helps. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is soil. Soils are, are very, very important. You should always soil test. You should soil test about six to eight months before you, you plan on planting. So always tell folks to soil test in about uh, August or so. Um, that way they can get their tests back and amend the soil as needed. Um, but basically, you need to have healthy soils with the correct pH. I see it so many times. Uh, the pH of the soils aren't where they supposed, are supposed to be. Most vegetables like a 5.5 five to 6.5 pH because they can take up a lot of different nutrients in the right way. And so if you're down here in the 4 range or you're down here in the 8 range, you're going to be deficient on some, some things. And so the plant never will really grow like it should. If the plant's not growing like it should, it's going to be more vulnerable to insect attack. Um, recently, I was at a, a BlackBerry meeting. And Dr. John, John Clark was there, and he's one of the world's best blackberry breeders. And he was talking about all these wonderful varieties of blackberries that they'd come out with and the size and the sweetness and the disease resistance and how great these plants were. And at the very end of his talk, this is one of the most profound things I think I've ever heard, but it's so simple. He said, no matter what variety you choose, nothing beats top-notch management. Um, so, you know, that just goes to say even the world's best breeder says, no matter how great these plants are, if you don't do the right things, giving the plant the right amount of fertilizer, the right amount of um, water, if you don't start with the right cultivars, if you don't do your management, it doesn't matter what quality plants you use, it's never going to be right. Um, just some tips on improving soil. Um, I talked about cover crops. I really recommend clover, cowpeas, vetches, rye, and millet. Um, some of these are cool season, some are warm season, and, and I'd be glad to go over any. I love cover crops, so anybody that wants to talk about those, uh, my contact information is at the end. Um, organic matter, a lot of the growers I work with are, are adding compost um, to their fields and just really improving their organic matter, their cation exchange capacity, or um, how well the soil holds on to nutrients. Um, 
the last thing I'll talk about with soil is, is you need to manage your weeds months in advance. Um, weeds harbor insect and disease. And if you don't manage the weeds, if you allow your fields to go uh, rogue, you're going to have a lot of problems when you start planting. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Irrigation and fertilizer. Um, I see too often folks, they water their plants before they go to work. When they get home, the plants are wilted down, especially during the summer. Um, you really need to avoid wet and dry periods. A plant really needs consistent moisture. Um, there are a lot of, of inexpensive drip systems that homeowners can use. Um, just keep in mind that larger plants obviously need more water than small plants. Um, and when they're fruiting, they're going to need a lot more water. Um, nutrition is important too, especially for insect management. Um, you can give plants as much fertilizer as you want, but if you give a plant a lot, a lot of nitrogen, what happens is the plant, it, it really overgrows. It turns really, really green. So if I'm an aphid or any type of sap feeding insect, I'm flying around and I see this really, really, really super green plant below me and everything else is just kind of normal green. So what am I going to do? That's like the plant having a sign on that says all you can eat buffet. And so the, the insects go there and then over, over time they get overwhelmed by so many insects um, feeding on the juices of plants. So don't over fertilize. Um, don't under fertilize. If you under fertilize, you're not going to have a healthy plant um, and then weak stunted plants. Any little attack you get by an insect, the plant's going to succumb to it because it's not a strong plant. Um, if you're interested more on fertilizer, you can use plant growth and nutrient curves. Um, this, this, um, little chart here I took from our vegetable crop handbook and it tells exactly the day that you're growing tomatoes how much nitrogen it needs and how much potash and so these farmers follow these charts and as you can see as the plant gets larger the plant needs more nitrogen um, and so we're not overdosing and we're not underdosing we're giving it exactly what it needs as the plant needs it and so that's really really important in insect management. Um, I talked about weed management. Uh, weed, weeds harbor insects, and those insects harbor diseases that come from the weeds that then we pass on to our crops. And so this picture on the left was a farm that I work on, um, and it was a tomato farm. Well, it was a mixed vegetable farm, but the, they had tomatoes growing, and the field obviously got away from them. But what's happening here is insects are down here in these weeds, they're feeding on the weeds, um, they're, they're vectoring viruses from the weeds and they're passing, on, passing it on to the tomatoes. So this field was infested with tomato spotted wilt virus, um, which is vectored by um, thrips. Um, this field on the right is a strawberry field. This is a, a current season production field. Um, and so the strawberries look nice and green, or the plants look nice and green right now, but I went and looked at them the other day and they're, they're yellow and stunted looking now. And what happened was this farmer, he hasn't been cultivating or weeding his alleys right here. And this is cut leaf evening primrose, which is a alternate host to the two spotted spider mite. Well, two spotted spider mites happen to be one of the worst pests we have in strawberries. And so because he's had this weed around year round, the, the spider mites have been having a party and, and feeding all year. And now that there's strawberries here, they just migrate over to the strawberries and we have huge, huge, huge um, spider mite issues in the strawberry and he can't get on top of it now because he mismanaged his weeds um, during the off season. So weed management is crucial for insect management. So I heard this quote uh, one time that says, the best thing you can do for your plants is cast your shadow on them. Just meaning that the more time you spend with your plants, the more times you, you spend gardening, the more time you spend looking for insects and diseases, the more familiar you're going to be with what's hurting your plants, what's not hurting your plants, and really the overall care for your plants. So spend time with them, put your shadow on them, um, and it'll really pay off on your veggie harvest. Do we have any questions up to this point? Anybody? I'm going to, I guess, take 30 seconds or so for questions. None at, none at this time, Zach. Okay. All right, so sort of the uh, middle part of this 
this presentation is talking about integrated pest management. Um, and I really, really promote this, but basically IPM is an ecological approach uh, to pest management that can significantly reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides. So the last thing we want to do is use pesticides. The goal is to prevent a pest or number of pests from reducing the value of your crop. Um, this, however, does not mean complete elimination or eradication of a pest. So in these systems, they're, they're, it's a biological system. So we need pests in our field to feed our beneficial insects. If we kill every single pest that was in our field, every single beneficial that we had would die. And so um, keeping some pests around, but keeping them below levels where they're really going to hurt our crop or really uh, devalue our crop is essential. Um, ideally, we want to promote long-term pest solutions. So we're going to use an a integrated approach. We're going to use biological control, cultural control, um, anything we can to not uh, use chemicals. All right, IPM is a decision-making process. And like I mentioned just a second ago, it, it involves biological, cultural, and chemical controls. Um, to really be a master at IPM, you really have to understand the life cycles and e ecological concepts. And so knowing that um, uh, an egg is laid on a collard, and out of that a caterpillar hatches, and that caterpillar goes through different growth stages, and then it turns into a moth, or then it turns into a butterfly. Knowing that process is really important. Um, too many times I think people misidentify insects because, um, you know, you have simple metamorphosis and you have complete metamorphosis and then incomplete metamorphosis. So there's, they look, basically insects look different at different stages of their life. And, and identifying them is, is really key. All right, the, the first key in management in an IPM system is pest ID. Um, this picture on the left is the pupae of a ladybird beetle larvae. You guys are all familiar with those. And these guys on the right are Colorado potato, potato beetle larvae. So I went, I went to a grower's farm one time, and he was really, really upset. He was walking through the field, and he was smashing all of these pupae. Everyone he saw, and by the time I got there, he had smashed hundreds of them, and he was mad because he thought Colorado potato beetles were in his field. And so what he was effectively doing was he misidentified it, because you can see they look very similar. He had misidentified the pest, and he was killing ladybird beetle larvae. And so what was out there to help him, he was actually killing them because of a misidentification. Um, so once we correctly identify the pest, the next thing we need to do is monitor the pests. And so, again, having pests in our field is not a bad thing as long as there's not too many of them where they're causing lots and lots of, of problems. Um, once we determine our injury level, how much injury to our plants are we accept, are accepting? Um, and then once they go beyond that level, we need to figure out what control strategies are out there. So I've talked about these three management types. Um, cultural control, biological control, and then chemical control. And we're going to go through all of these. Um, and just know that, that management is based on need and not schedule. I see, oftentimes I see too many folks, um, they spray every Friday. And you ask them why they're spraying every Friday. And it's because that's what dad did in his garden. And so in an IPM system, you have to be out in your field every Friday, um, but you don't necessarily need to spray every Friday. So I'm going to introduce the players in an IPM system. The first player is, is what we're all after are the pests. And a pest is any insect that can cause economic or aesthetic damage to ag, ornamental, or native plants. Again, they're a key part in the IPM system. We want them there, but we want them there at very, very low levels. Okay, this picture on the left is a Colorado potato beetle. And then if you look here, this is a tiny, tiny lepidopteran pest in a collard crop. All right, I like to think of pests in two different ways, um, direct pests and indirect pests. So a direct pest is an insect that causes direct damage to your fruit or vegetable. And so an example could be the tomato fruit worm. As you see it right here, um, nobody wants to pick a tomato and see that in their tomato. 
Um, and so they're doing direct damage to your fruit. An indirect pest on the same crop, tomato, would be spider mites. Um, spider mites basically feed on the plant juices, the leaves of the plant, and they suck the juice out of the plant and the plant doesn't photosynthesize as much. So they're not making as much sugar. And when they're not making as much sugar, they're not producing as much fruit. The fruit um, is not as sweet as it could be. And the plants are often um, nutrient deficient and very, very small and weak. And so this pest doesn't really cause direct damage to the tomato, but it hurts the plant, which in turn hurts the tomato. Okay. So these guys are my favorite. These are beneficial pests, our insects. And there's two types. There's predators and then there's parasitoids. So a predator is any, any insect that runs around and actively hunts pests. So if you'll look at this picture on the right, this is a crop of buckwheat that I grew. And I happened to catch this wheel bug, which is a great predator. And you see in his, in his arms there, he is, he's actually with his proboscis, he's sucking the juice out of some type of little insect. I can't remember what insect that was, but he caught them and, and I was lucky enough to get this picture. That's an example of a predator. And then a parasitoid is, is probably the most effective natural enemy. And what they do is the insects lay eggs inside of another insect and then they develop inside of that host and then they hatch out and the, the host dies and then all the babies go out and they find pets to infect. And so this is a picture um, I was doing some research on spider mites and I happened to run across this in a tomato crop, but these green things are aphids. And then this, this one right here is a, a mummified aphid. So what happens is these tiny wasps lay eggs into these aphids and then the eggs develop. And when they get done developing, they pop out of the backside of this aphid. And then there's hundreds, tens, hundreds, thousands of them that fly around and they, they look for aphids to infect. And so this is really, really cool. And when I see this in a commercial grower's field, they'll ask me, um, they'll find aphids in their field. And they'll say, Zach, what do, I, what do I need to spray? And if I can find a bunch of these aphid mummies, then I tell them not to spray because that means all those little insects are going out to other areas looking for aphids to lay eggs inside of. Um, I think this is pretty cool. I'll pull this um, from the, the crop handbook that I referred to earlier. Um, but this is an approximate number of North American species of beneficial insects. So there's 16,500 species of wasps that are um, parasitoids, 3,300 species of flies, 235 species of true bugs, 6,290 species of beetles, and then there are 30 others. That means there are a total of 26,355 different species of beneficial insects that are out there doing pest control for you, whether you know it or not. Now, that's in North America, so you're not going to have that many at your house or at your farm, but just think if we had a fraction of these. Just think if we had 5,000 in your farm or your house. That's 5,000 of these insects that are doing pest control for you. Um, this picture here on the right is an assassin bug, and you can see his proboscis. He's, <clears throat> I think this was a, a tiny wasp that he had caught. Um, but these guys, if you'll look for them, they're on plants all the time, and you can find them, and, and occasionally they'll have little insects in their mouth that are feeding on them. Okay, so in an IPM system, we have cultural controls. We have biological controls, and then we have, lastly, chemical controls. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural controls now. And, and when, when you're talking about cultural controls, what I like to think is a cultural control is what I can do as a gardener or a farm manager, what I can do um, to promote uh, pest management. So the first thing I look at is I look at the, the variety of plants I'm growing, and I look to see if those plants have resistance or some type of tolerance to the insect that's feeding on them. Um, a lot of times some crops are preferred over other crops and so just by experience of growing different things you kind of learn this and you'll grow the crops that are more tolerant of aphids or you'll grow the crops that are more tolerant of worms or could even possibly be resistant. Um, the second thing I look at and what I see a lot is, is folks over fertilize 
Um, they, they give the plants a lot, a lot of nitrogen. That causes, again, the plant to be really green and the insects want to feed on it because it's green. Um, this picture here was taken in a commercial tomato field that I work in. We've been uh, growing tomatoes on this type of, of mulch for probably eight, eight years, maybe 10 years now. Um, what this mulch does is it's reflective. And so we plant tomatoes in this mulch and the insects that are sap feeders, so our thrips, our uh, white flies and our aphids are very simple uh, minded creatures. And so they know that light is up and dark is down. And so they're flying on their migrations and they come to a tomato field. And in this tomato field, there is this bright reflective mulch. And when you go in these tomato fields, you have to wear sunscreen, you have to wear sunglasses because it's very, very bright and you'll get blistered really, really easily. So they're flying and they go over these fields and it's really, really black, bright and it disorients them. And so they tend to fly off. And so because we're using this reflective mulch or this plastic film, these insects never go in a tomato field. Okay, they're repelled away just by using this mulch. Um, another thing we can do is, is called exclusion, and that's um, particularly easy if you're growing in like raised bed gardens. All exclusion means is if you got plants growing, you provide some kind of physical barrier between the plant and the insect that's trying to feed on it. So I've seen netting, um, I've seen the uh, woven fabric, uh, we call them row covers, I've seen those used, and it, it makes a uh, physical barrier between the plant and the insect. Um, the next cultural control is trap crops. Um, what this means is if we can grow a crop in one place and then right beside it grow another crop that the insect that's gonna be a pest likes better, is, is preferred more over the other one, then we grow that. So right now I have a bunch of tomato growers. We're having a terrible time with stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs. And so the growers are planting their tomatoes, and on the borders of the tomato rows, they're seeding buckwheat and sorghum. So what happens is the buckwheat and sorghum grow out, and they've got it down their timing. And so when it seeds out, uh, the, the, the seed head of the buckwheat and the sorghum, when it goes to make a seed, that's called the milking or doughing stage. And stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs really, really like um, that. They prefer it over tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. And so what the growers are doing, the organic growers, is when they, the stink bugs start congregating on the buckwheat, they'll go through with sweet nets and just sweep them up and then dump them in a bucket of soapy water. The commercial farmers I work with, what they're doing is they're using chemicals that would kill the stink bugs and the leaf-footed bugs, but they're only spraying the buckwheat and the sorg because that's where the insects are congregated. And that way it keeps them out of the tomatoes and peppers. Um, another thing for, for stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs is, is managing overwintering habitat. So, you know, if you have a lot of junk around your, your house or your farm or your garden, you know, a lot of wood, pallets, um, maybe you got things laying around. That's a lot of times where these insects overwinter. And so if you can remove those places, then you remove their overwintering habitat. Um, I talked about weeds earlier, managing weeds throughout the year. That's, that's managing your habitat. And then the last thing is just manual removal. And that's a lot easier said than done, but um, the best insecticide ever created is your two fingers. Um, so uh, just going through and picking them off, it's a lot easier to do in a home setting than a, than a large farm, but it is a great method, um, again, of managing pests. This is a cool uh, picture I took. These are two eggplant varieties. This was in the same exact field. These plants were uh, right beside each other. Um, as you can see, the one on the left is a white variety or a cream variety. Um, and all these holes on it is stink bug damage. Tons and tons of stink bugs um, are piercing this fruit and causing these defects. And this is an unmarketable fruit. Well, the one on the right was right beside it. And as you can clearly see, there's no stink bug damage on this eggplant. They were right beside each other. So it just goes to show, you know, knowing your varieties, knowing that stink bugs like this one on the left, but they don't like the one on the right, you can grow the one on the right and not use the first pesticide. All right, our next uh, mode of IPM management is biological control. Um, 
biological control just means uh, using natural enemies or the beneficials I've talked about before um, in your system. And so what we want to do is we really want to conserve these guys. And so we don't want to use broad spectrum chemicals. I'll, I'll get to some of those active ingredients later, but you really want to refrain from using those. Um, and you want to promote uh, long-term pest solutions by not spraying and letting the, the beneficials feed on, in your farm. Um, the next two things is um, releasing beneficials. So you may have heard of releasing um, ladybird beetle larvae um, as seen here. Um, you can buy those. Um, a lot of folks for spider mite control, they release predatory mites that eat spider mites. Um, that's a good, another good thing to do. Um, and the last thing is just be cognizant of, of where your pollinators are and your beneficials are and really try to enhance their habitat. And so this is a farm that I work on. Um, this grower had Swiss chard um, here and the Swiss chard was gone and the season was over. So what he did is he came back in on this row he wasn't going to use for a few months and he planted dill. And I don't know if you've ever let dill, um, if you've let dill go to seed, but when you let dill flower and go to seed, if you just stand there and, and watch, you will be amazed at how many insects come into that dill to feed on that flower. It's, it's literally like you're in an airport. I mean, you can count 15, 20, 30 species within two or three minutes that are feeding on those flowers. And when you keep those insects there feeding on the flowers, they're also going out into your field and they're um, actively hunting down pests and they're laying eggs and pests and they're completing their life cycle. So really just try to let things go to flower and really promote um, a habitat for these beneficials. The last type of biocontrol I want to talk about are pathogens. Um, sometimes you get lucky and there are pathogens out there that will take care of your pests. So a good example, I was in a commercial collard field years ago and um, the field was completely infested with cabbage worms and uh, diamondback moss. And so I went back two or three days later, I was doing a research study and I came back and all of them were dead. All of them were brown and black and shriveled up and I, I had no idea what happened. So I got to looking it up and there's a virus called MPV. It's naturally occurring, and it's a virus that kills um, diamondback moss and cabbage loopers. And so just by good fortune, that virus came through and cleaned up the field for that farmer. So it was pretty neat to see. Um, so I've talked about this, but basically we want to provide habitat for beneficials. We need plants with small flowers. A lot of these insects, for lack of a better word, they have a small tongue. And for the adults to complete their life cycle, they have to feed on the pollen and nectar of these tiny, tiny little plants. And so if we can provide um, this type of habitat for them year round, they're gonna, do, they're gonna be around more and do more pest control for us. So this is a grower I work with. He let this arugula, after he cut it three or four times, go to seed um, and, and flower out. And so there are tons and tons of insects here. And he does this um, every season he lets it flower out and so there's not a season when he doesn't have something flowering in his field and he rarely 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 uses chemicals um, and then our last option um, is chemical control I would stay away from this as long as I could but if you have to venture down this path I would recommend that you use um, what I call soft products um, what this means is is they're very um, they're, they're easy on the beneficials so they're not going to have as, as many targeted effects on a beneficial insect, um, but the key in using these soft products is you have to have um, correct identification of the pest. And so the most uh, probably common soft product we use is BT. Uh, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. And what it is, is, is this for caterpillars. And so it will only kill caterpillars. So you gotta make sure you have caterpillars. Um, but this product is pretty safe to spray. Um, you can find it in most places, but it's a, it's a great product that I would have on hand if I was a, a gardener. Um, insecticidal soaps, they work by physically smothering insects. Um, uh, a lot of these insects breathe out of spiracles, sporkles, and um, these insecticidal soaps cover them so they can't uh, respirate. Uh, the next one is neem oil. I really like neem. Neem is a good insecticide. It's a, also a good fungicide as well, so it's a, a good chemical to have. Um, the last two, spinosad and pyrethrin, they're, um, they're soft chemicals. They don't really last that long, but they do um, have a little bigger effect than, than a BT or insecticidal soap. So kind of use those sparingly 
only use them really if you need to. Uh, but these are the ones that I would recommend. Um, these next ones are what we call synthetic chemicals. And so they're made in a lab. Um, and a lot of these, uh, these four groups I have here are, um, you can find them at home and garden stores, but really, really try to stay away from these because these are broad spectrum. So they're going to kill um, pretty much anything they come in contact with. So uh, bifenthrin, permethrin, sifluthrin, all these are, are what we call synthetic pyrethroids. Um, and they're going to be in group three. So they, they're in different groups because they kill the insect in similar ways. So a group three insecticide kills insects differently than a group 1A. Okay, But all of these are um, fairly harsh on our beneficial species. If you do choose to use these products, spray late in the afternoon um, because uh, bees and beneficial insects are going to be pollinating during the day. So if you spray at night when they've gone to bed, there's less of a chance that they're going to come in contact with that chemical. Um, adjuvants, adjuvants don't get talked about a lot, but adjuvant basically is just a product that modifies the effect of another product. Um, and so some examples are spreaders, stickers, wetting agents, crop oils. Um, a good example is a collard plant. If you spray any kind of spray on a collard, it's going to beat up and run off. And so if you use an adjuvant, what's going to happen is it's going to reduce the surface tension of that water with that pesticide in it. And it's going to stick on the plant. That's what the sticker part is. And then it's going to spread. So it's going to spread out and break the surface tension. And so it actually stays on the leaf. Um, if you're a, a farmer, you can buy these from your, um, your uh, crop, crop protection people. Um, if you're a home gardener, the, you can buy these too. But a good example is to use a drop, of, drop or two of liquid dish soap in your spray mixture. And that acts as a spreader and a sticker. Um, spraying, if you do spray, um, for insects, what you want to do, you want to make sure you read all the labels, make sure you identify the pest correctly. Um, once you do that, you want to get a good spray coverage. And for insects, you want to have a high pressure on your sprayer. High, high pressure generally makes the, the uh, chemical uh, or the, the droplet size shrink. And so when you have smaller droplet sizes, you get a better uniform coverage. Um, and you want to avoid runoff. Don't spray a plant until it runs off, because when it runs off, you're taking the, the pesticide with it. Um, here you see on these spray cards, what we did, these are water sensitive spray cards. And so they turn blue when water hits them. So what we did here, we put this one here on the left on the inside of a fern, the one on the right on the outside of a fern. Um, and then this bottom was, it was a backpack sprayer at a 20 PSI. So, so 20 pounds of pressure. Okay, as you can see, there wasn't much insecticide that got on the inside of the plant, but there was a little bit that got on the outside. The second card, this is the inside of the plant, this is the outside of the plant. We put it at about a 60 PSI, so a hot, lot higher pressure. And as you can see, the droplets are a lot smaller, but there's more of them, and so you get a better coverage. Um, some chemicals, and especially insecticides, are what we call contact poison, so they have to come in contact with the insect. And so there's a lot better chance that that chemical comes in contact with the, the insect in this example rather than this one here. Um, and then these last two cards, I have a backpack blower sprayer. And so what that is, think about a weed, weed blower or a um, leaf blower hooked to a backpack sprayer. So it blows the pesticide into the plant. And so as you can see here, the whole thing is blue. And so we got really, really good coverage. It's going to be impossible for an insect to... Um, it's going to be impossible for this insect to escape. Um, calibration and equipment, whatever equipment you do use to spray, make sure it's calibrated. If it says you need to spray, you know, 10 gallons per acre, make sure you're spraying 10 gallons per acre. A lot of times I see folks going way off of that and it really messes up uh, the efficacy or how well your, your pesticide works. Um, there are different types of sprayers. Don't get caught up too much in that, but whatever you have can work for you. Um, just go to your local extension office and they can help you with that. Um, this picture here on the left, I wanted to mention this. Um, the grower was using a sprayer and his nozzles were different. So he was using a different nozzle going over this bed. And as you can see, the collards on the right-hand side, they look excellent. The ones on the left don't. And so what he did was he either overdosed or underdosed um, his plants. And so that's the, the kind of things you see when you don't calibrate and make sure your equipment is working properly. 
So just general IPM recommendations for everyone. You want to increase beneficial habitat as much as you can. A lot of the farms I work on, they just let flowers grow everywhere. And so that really, really helps with that. Um, avoid broad spectrum insecticides. Those harsh chemicals we talked about, stay away from those. Um, I had a farmer tell me that I worked with, he said the less we spray, the, more, the fewer problems we have. And so I think that's a testament to using IPM and, and other things other than chemicals. Any questions? Do we have any questions? No, we've had a few come across or at least some conversation in uh, chat, but um, none at this time. But certainly, folks, if you have questions, go ahead and put those in um, Q&A at this time. Hey, Zach, I did have a question by text. Yeah. Um, and the question was pertaining to home or backyard gardens. Uh -huh. They're asking about sticky traps or other traps that they could use in mm -hmm. their garden to monitor insect pests. Yeah, so I like, I like them as a monitoring tool. I wouldn't use them ever as a control tool, um, but they do work to see what species you have. And, and as long as you're on top of, of identifying them the right way and then, you know, using the appropriate control measure, I, I like, yes, I like them. All right. Is there a particular is there a particular color type of trap that a, that a, that maybe a backyard or home gardener might might make or buy? Yeah, you can buy um, yellow yellow cards, and we use yellow ones. Um, yellow a lot of times mimics the um, the flower color. So in tomatoes and a lot of your brassicas, um, the flower is attractive to those insects. So we use yellow a lot. All right. Thank you. And there was one more. Okay. And this was about organic insecticides. Yes. So and there was a, the, the, the question was pertaining to organic insecticides and beneficials. Yes. Um, most of the time, the organic insecticides we use, like the BT, the neems, insecticidal oils, they generally don't have an effect on the beneficials um, directly. But sometimes if you use like BT and you wipe out all the caterpillars, then your beneficials have a hard time because it reduces their food source. And so you'll kind of see their population crash um, as an as a indirect result rather than a direct result. But, you know, that <laughs> you can only help so much, right? Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, can we put up the poll questions? Yes. And we'll keep asking questions. Sure. But if we can go ahead and get those poll questions up, because I see another question, and it is about wasps. And the question is, are all wasps good? Yeah, I, I like Tim's response, <laughs> except when they sting you. <laughs> um, for the most part, yeah, most wasps are good. Um, they're going to be um, active hunters and, and go out and do a lot of pest control for you. Um, so, yeah, as long as you don't mess with them too much, yes, they're good. There's a couple, couple of questions. There, there's, Danny, there's a few questions in Q&A, uh, if you want to look there. Bob, Bob asked, what, what was the plant in the last photo? I think it was the one maybe right before you were on. That was um, a Romanesco, and some folks call it a broccoli, some call it a cauliflower, but um, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, plant. It grows, um, it takes about 85 days from seed to harvest, and uh, it tastes like cauliflower, but it's, it's a lot nuttier. Um, it's, it's, it's awesome. I, if you can grow, um, any type of cauliflower, I would recommend this one. It's, it's fabulous. And okay. It's here's a, another one. It says, is there any problems with using BT and insecticidal soap around honeybees? Um, not with the BT, definitely not. Um, with the insecticidal soap, probably not as long as you didn't spray it directly on the bee. So, um, you would have to, you know, coat it pretty thoroughly to kill a bee. And, and the reason it works on aphids and white flies and thrips is when we spray them, they're small and they really don't go anywhere. Um, and so that's why it works so well on them is because it physically coats them. Let's see, here is another one from Bob, and it says, what is the plant in the last photo? And the question just came in two minutes ago, so I'm assuming it was the... The Romanesco. There you go. Yep. And is it true, this is from Patty, 
Is it true that some traps use pheromones and will attract even more pests if you use them for too long? Yeah, so a classic example of that is um, the Japanese beetle traps. Um, they have um, a smell in them. I, I, don't, I can't remember if it's a pheromone or not. Vicky may have to help me with this one, but um, basically what it does is attract every uh, Japanese beetle in, in the neighborhood to your house. And on the way to the trap, they're going to feed on your roses and your grapes and everything else. So I, sometimes, yeah, you, you don't want to use them for that reason. And then we have Gibson County asking if you could maybe quickly refresh the beneficial list again. Maybe um, name a couple of the, highlight a couple of the beneficial insects that you went over today. Sure. Uh, my favorites are surfid flies, um, broccanoid wasps, um, wheel bugs are always fun to find. Um, and a really cool one is a, is a robber fly. One time I saw a robber fly, um, they're probably an inch or maybe an inch and a half. It had a dragonfly that was about four inches long and it was carrying it off to eat it. So that was really, really cool to see. See, I'm, I'm looking and that's all the questions I see okay. in the Q&A. Anybody else out there have a question? Anybody? All right. Well, Mr. Zach, I certainly, certainly appreciate you being here today. That was, that was a really awesome webinar. Sure. Really appreciate it. Yep. And I can go over a tomato example if, if, if I have time. If you, have, hear it. you have time, please do. Okay. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give an example of, of a crop here and how I would approach this crop. So we grow a lot of tomatoes here in Charleston. We grow a spring and a fall crop. And I know before we ever plant our first tomato, um, that we're going to have problems with ants, cutworms, and mole crickets. We're going to have problems with thrips. We're going to have problems with lepidopterans. So those are your caterpillars. And then we're going to have problems with spider mites and stink and leaf footed bugs. Okay. So ants, cutworms, and mole crickets, you're going to get this type of typical damage. You're going to get a plant that's cut off or girdled. And then if you dig around in the soil, you're going to find um, these worms, these caterpillars here. Um, usually it's an early season problem, so you see it right after transplanting or, um, or right at seedling germination is when you're going to find them. Um, so the solution to this, without using chemicals, you can do crop rotations. You can cultivate, which means just um, manage your weeds because a lot of the weed species we have are alternate hosts for these guys. And so if you really manage your soil the right way, you can pretty much get rid of them. Um, another cool trick is if you take aluminum foil and wrap it around the, the tomato stem, and then you kind of halfway bury the aluminum foil and leave the rest of it above the plant, it makes a physical barrier between the soil and the plant. And so the bug and insect can't, uh, the cutworm, the ants, the mole crickets can't um, cut the plant in half. So that's a cool trick. Um, there are some baits that are labeled. Uh, for ants um, in the garden, but you have to make sure that they're labeled for vegetable gardens. But again, you can manage it without using those baits um, if you just manage your soil and manage your aluminum foil. So um, the second one is thrips. Thrips are a tiny, tiny insect um, that, that spread the vector disease called tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, and a lot of times you'll get silver to white etching on plant leaves. You get stunted plants, and then the classic symptom, as you see here, this is not the feeding damage, but this is the virus that the insect carries that it gives to the tomato. Um, the timing of this is very early season and after transplants are set in the field. And so the solution to this, and this is what growers here use, is they use varieties. We know we're going to get that disease because we have that insect, so we use varieties that have resistance to that disease that's transmitted by that insect. So we do that, we use the TSWV resistant varieties. We also use the reflective mulches that I talked about earlier. And so we can control that whole disease pest complex by not spraying the first insecticide. Um, our next pest uh, later in the season are your lepidopterans, so your uh, caterpillars. Um, they do indirect damage, as you can see here, here's the caterpillar. They're gonna feed on the leaves of the plants. Um, and then you have ones that do direct damage or feed inside of the fruit. 
Um, you're going to have these. They're going to be persistent throughout the entire season. So what I would do was I would provide beneficial habitat. So I would have strips of buckwheat. I would have strips of clover. Maybe I have dill that I let go to seed or cilantro. If you have that habitat there, you're going to keep those beneficials there year round. Um, if you did want to um, spray, you could spray BT, which I talked about is a, is an insecticide just for caterpillars. Um, and that's mainly for the, the foliage feeders. Um, but for conventional growers, if you're a farmer, it's pretty interesting that we have a lot of rotational chemistries. And so we have one, two, three, four. We have five groups of chemistries that will kill worms that won't kill anything else. They will only kill worms. And so even our conventional farmers are using these products and they're only using them once or twice because they're managing their beneficial habitats. They're doing everything right. And then they have these rotational groups that only kill caterpillars. Um, if you're a home gardener or you want to do more of an organic or a bio-rational um, approach, BT, insecticidal soap, spinosad, and neem are all good choices for these. Um, Two-spotted spider mite, this has become a real huge problem for us. Um, they cause a, a nutrient deficiency looking plant. So if you look at your plant and it's not as green as it should be and you flip it over and they're really hard to see, but you see these tiny dots, those are your spider mites. And if you magnify them, this is what they look like. Um, they're mid to late season pests. So be prepared before um, the middle of the season. They're seen in hot, dry weather. Um, the best thing to manage these is do not spray these chemicals in these groups. We talked about these groups being broad spectrum chemicals. And so what happens is if you spray these, it kills everything out there. It kills the beneficials. And then you have population spikes because nothing keeps these guys under control. Um, again, if you're a your home gardener, neem oil, sulfur dust, and even releasing predatory mites helps with these pests. Um, stinking leaf footed bugs, I kind of talked about that early. Or um, if you see these spotting, spotting like this on your fruit, um, it's because of stink and leaf-footed bug damage. So again, the trap crops, the buckwheat, the sorghum, and the okra, um, our growers are doing that, and they're only spraying those cro um, trap crops rather than spraying uh, the crop that we're going to get our fruit from. Um, and you see here, this is buckwheat with one of the leaf-footed bugs on it. So, you know, you can treat this and not have to treat the tomato. But basically with tomatoes, you just need to know your potential pest and knowing your timing goes a long way. Um, you can manage an entire commercial tomato crop with very few sprays. And the, the key that I want you guys to, this, to take home is stay away from these broad spectrum chemicals. They do more damage than they do good. So um, I did a squash example, but I know we're kind of running out of time. So we're going to post these online and you guys can use these. But these are some pests that we have with squash. Um, as well as brassicas, um, the pests, and then how to deal with those. So feel free to go through those. Um, there's my contact information if you, you guys ever need anything from me. Um, are there any other questions? Back, someone asked about uh, a good way to prevent leaf miners. Um, I don't know to be, to be honest with you, we don't have them that much in Charleston. Um, where I am is, it's not a huge problem. I would suspect that the horticultural oils would be good because they, they'll create a barrier between the plant and the insect laying the eggs, um, that go into the plant. I would suspect that that would be a good control, but like I said, we don't, we don't run into that one very much. Uh, Anybody gonna, else? Yeah, any, any last qu uh, questions, go ahead and ask them now. I'm putting a link in uh, chat. This is uh, the April 7th webinar for all, all bugs, good and bad. So go ahead and put that date on your calendar. Yeah, come on. That one's going to be a good one. That one's going to be on mosquitoes and insect-borne diseases. Something I don't think any of us want. <laughs> hey, well, Zach, we certainly appreciate you being here today. That was a lot of good information yes ma'am thank you guys for having me i really enjoyed it y'all have right. a great weekend we'll see you next month thanks All everyone bye-bye right.